I don't plan on being in therapy for a whole lot of the rest of my life, although it's great to have something to go back to periodically. Um, I love chanting. I still love listening to Krishna Das, but I do it with the door tightly closed. <laughs> the Jimmy won't come in on me. Um, what else? Uh, somatic experiencing, not so much, but I remember the principles of it. Um, the tanka painting, oh, now I'm obsessed with making jewelry, and I really like making it when I'm in a meditative state. Like After you meditate, it's really interesting. You can see, when I get up from meditating, and I go into the house that's full of other people, I can feel my voice as a totally different, it's not pressured, it's just a really different sound than it did before I go in and meditate. So I really like to meditate before I do something creative, like writing or making jewelry. Um, what else do I do? I don't know, what do I do, Jimmy? I've been in bed for so long with bronchitis <laughs> that I can't remember. Um, I, wanna, I want to um, I wanna do creative things that aren't necessarily writing, which is why I like jewelry making and everything. And I just, I still watch what I eat and I am careful about, I, but I recognize it. You know, the other day I got a decaf coffee and it was clearly not decaf because I was shopping at Fairway afterwards and I was like, wow, I think I'm having a panic attack. And then I go, why would I have a panic attack? I, I, but I could feel like my heart racing and everything. I'm like, oh, that woman gave me, I didn't go to my usual place and I bet she gave me caffeine. caffeine. Do you worry that if you did not practice on a regular basis meditation that you would get these attacks again, that they're, they're always lurking? No, I don't feel like I get the attacks again, but I, I feel like anxiety would percolate a, a, around me. Mm -hmm. I wish that I was this way about dieting, that I thought, you know, oh my God, if I eat too many cupcakes, you know, I'll relapse to, <laughs> to you know, whatever the equivalent of panicking would be for eating, but unfortunately that's not the case. I'm so happy that um, I can eat cupcakes without feeling terrible or guilty. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to be happy. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I'm not a panic sufferer. I've ha I have had two panic attacks in my life, but it's not a disorder for me. I am an obsessive ruminator, um, <laughs> but it doesn't escalate. Um, but I do have a lot of mental illness in my family, um, and uh, mostly in depression. And so I've grown up uh, learning what's helpful and what's not. Mostly what's not, I guess. There's little that is, but mostly what's not. Um, and I have a dear friend that I've been very close with since third grade, and uh, she is the panic sufferer. Um, and so I guess my question is just, if you have anything that's particularly helpful from your loved ones, um, or particularly not. For your friend, you're talking For about. my friend. Uh, as being the friend. Yeah, what as, do you do if you're friend? Oh, what do you do yeah. for like, a person? What did you who, find? Well, that's really um, interesting because I never had a panic attack in front of another person. I did in front of my husband once, which I write about in the book, and it was so mortifying. And I took medication. I'm really not anti-medication at all. And I think it's really important not to do that to people who are suffering from any kind of mental illness because it just adds pressure. And that's the last thing that somebody needs. And not to be judgmental. Um, so I would A, not be judgmental of anything that they decided to do or not to do. But uh, it was really, it was kind of, if you're with somebody when they're having a panic attack, somebody asked me this in an event, I think I would um, like to be guided to a quiet spot, somewhere, anywhere, not where all the activity is. I like to slump on the floor. And um, I would like somebody to sit with me and to touch me, to um, Adrian Stone, who's here today, who's my Traeger therapist. It was this episode where I almost had a panic attack on the table. That was a time in the book where I really did. And, and I said I was quivering like a greyhound in a thunderstorm. And she, and I said to her, I think I'm having a panic attack. And she said, really? And I said, well, let's put it this way. I was out on the street, and I felt this way. I would like gobble down some vodka as fast as I could. And so she said, why don't you roll over? And her voice didn't change. You know, she was comforting. And, not alarmed, and she got me some water, so maybe I'm dehydrated. You know, I had this science experiment constantly in my head, like I did this, I did that, and I'm trying. The mind is always trying to figure something out when you say you're a ruminator. The wonderful thing about meditation is it creates a little distance between you and your thoughts, and so that you're not as, if that loop gets interrupted or slowed down. But um, she just placed her, so Adrian, when I was having this, she just placed her hands sort of on my rib cage and 
she held me there and and I calmed down. I could feel it happening very slowly without any drugs or anything I was doing. And afterwards I said to her, What what did you what did you do to me? And she said, I just stayed with you. And I started to cry because I said nobody ever did that. And I just didn't or not what was me, but I just didn't grow up in a family where that was done, where somebody comforted me. So I'd say, just to say that you'll always be there for somebody physically and that that sense of touch, you know, just having somebody touch you in the back with a little bit of pressure, you know, kindness. Kindness is the best drug of all. There's one over here. there. Thank you. Um, my question is that I'd imagine somehow that your career choice was influenced <laughs> by your anxiety. And now with your new discoveries, I'm curious if your writing style and the process of writing for you has changed totally. as you move forward. <laughs> totally. In fact, I was a little afraid of it, you know, because one of the things that I love dearly about Meredith is her um, self-deprecating sense of humor. And I think actually self-deprecating is not the right word. It's, it's humility. Hum I love humility in other people. And so I love her sense of humor. And she knows how to make fun of herself. And, and I was my best source of material. And erotics, you know, Woody Allen. And, and it's, it's like such a natural. And I can make my husband laugh at the, you know, like that with anything neurotic. So yeah, I was afraid, you know, like, what, I'm not Sylvia Plath. I mean, what am I going to write now? I, and, and I'm just so damn happy, I don't know what to do. So I'm, the paperback is coming out May 1st. I'm going to be blogging for it. And, um, and I, I kept a diary of my mother's entire experience with Alzheimer's for the last 12 years. And some of it, I think, is really beautiful. And, um, and I think that I am going to eventually go back to it and work on it. But I don't know. It's really hard. It's kind of that thing where, you know, manic depressive, bipolar people don't like to take their meds because they're afraid they won't be creative. Yeah, happiness is kind of, it alters everything. I'm really different. I don't know, Jimmy, there's my husband in the front row. Am I really different? Oh, yeah, somebody said to him, is she really mellow? He, he thought for me, he said, 99% mellow. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the percentage before? Maybe 50%, oh, wow. That's very generous of you. <laughs> I, I'm not keeping track of time, so somebody must be. Um, great. I'd stay here all night. But go ahead. Hold on one sec. Hi. Um, I just want to ask you, you said to um, recommend building up to 20 minutes of um, meditating. And there are some yoga, or not yoga, some meditation retreats where you go for a weekend. And then there's one that I'm familiar with where it's actually called Vipassana Yoga, or um, meditation, and it's 11 days. Are you familiar with that, and where do you weigh in with it? Well, you know, my first retreat was a five-day retreat, and so I meditated for hours. I came home from that retreat, honestly, so different. My body, my the brain changes just from meditating, you know, I don't know, three or four hours a day, maybe. I think it's just three hours a day for three or four days were huge. So I think that those retreats are great if you want like a complete immersion. And I think it, maybe there's like a before and after, a more dramatic before and after than if you just start off slowly. Sharon Salzberg has a wonderful book called Real Happiness, which is a 28-day meditation, not a challenge, but um, that's the program. So I think it's just a matter of if you want that you know, complete immersion. A lot of the people, you know, it, it's not inexpensive to go to a retreat, but a lot of the people I met at the first retreat had, you know, they worked in the kitchens and they do whatever they could to pay for, for that experience. And, you know, they worked hard the rest of their lives and they really looked forward to this huge, um, you know, separation between their old life and their new life, I think. started meditating, did you ever have trouble quieting your mind? You're such a, a busy, wonderful, beautiful, professional woman, a wife, a mother, an author, goes on and on. Did, 
Would you ever have trouble just like hiding your mind and focusing and able? Never, not for a second, actually. <laughs> yes, I, I was a terrible meditator. You know, that's part of the process. I wanted to think, like I thought if I went and hung out with this monk, that he would, you know, transmit something to me that would, I really, now it seems idiotic, but I really thought I was gonna get some, like, you know, if you just go to the monk, you'll be the monk. <laughs> and um, it's constant. Today when I was meditating, like all sorts of things were coming into my head. But the wonderful, one of the things that Sharon Salzberg says is you can always begin again. And that the most important part moment of meditation is when your mind does wander and you bring it back. But not, not forcing it back, but um, all of the best teachers will, will happily tell you about all of the times when you know they're not meditating. Uh, this wonderful guy, Matthew Ricard, who they call the happiest man in the world, who um, he said, I heard him in a radio interview and he said, they said something like, well, so because his brain has been studied, so you've meditated for you know, 40,000 hours. And he said, yeah, but you know, it was like a half an hour real meditation, <laughs> which I loved. You know, these people are very honest, and um, I mean, no, I wasn't an instant yogi. <laughs> Actually, my yoga teacher can tell you. I mean, she had to lead me through many, she did this great chakra meditation with me where I was just lying on the floor, and you know, she did, I didn't know what all those colors meant, and um, I, that's why I, I really do like guided meditation sometimes when you don't have that oomph to do it yourself. But you don't get graded in it. Nobody knows whether what you're doing. It's just you and yourself, you know? I think that, okay, we got one more. Yeah. Uh, sure, why don't we just get there? Why not? We can all meditate while we're <laughs> <laughs> It's um, PriscillaWarnerBooks.com. I'm wondering, in, in the work that you did in, in preparing for this book, how your understanding of happiness changed. Because in the work that I do, I often talk to people who want to be happy, and they think of happiness as doing a, you know, a joyful dance all the time, doing a jig. And, and in my experience, and I think more of what you're talking about, happiness is really feeling grounded and settled in oneself. And that wasn't my perception of happiness when I started life and, and moved forward on my journey. So I'm wondering how that changed and, and what changed it for you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I guess everybody's definition is different. It's a warm puppy, you know, some people it's, I mean, a person would tell you, you know, they're looking for that constant, like, high of happiness. Um, I would say for me, happiness is gratitude. Happiness is when I am grounded enough to be grateful. And for me, gratitude is a happiness practice. The first Jewish prayer of the day is you wake up and you say, thank you, God, for returning my soul to my body. We may ever trust in you. And that's how I start every day, just being grateful. I have so much to be grateful for. So I would say, for me, happiness is a gratitude practice. Whereas I did used to think that it was some thing that I could attain, that I had to keep trying to attain over and over again, racing to the top of the happiness mountain. And now it's just with me all the time, and it's really just gratitude. Do we have time for one more? Sure. The mic around here. I guess you can shout out. Okay. How do you handle a major tragedy in your we life? Our child. Are we ever going to be happy again? I know that's hard for me to answer because it didn't happen to you. But I don't see happiness in our future. I'm so sorry. Very, very sorry for what you've experienced. Um, I think that you the most comforting thing to me throughout this experience is that moments come and moments go. And the last person I studied with at this Zen Cantor, well, she is part of the Zen Center for Contemplative Care, and she helps people who are dying. And it's a very, very strict meditation practice where you stare at a white wall and nobody was moving, and um, 
people weren't, like people weren't even like thought, not allowed, but people weren't scratching their itches or you know shifting their positions. And afterwards, actually, I make, maybe can I read you something from the book that that I that spoke to me today because uh, the cherry blossoms are out in full bloom in my front yard today. So uh, her name is Roshi Pat O'Hara. And uh, so many, the wonderful thing about this experience was I got to meet so many wise, kind, compassionate people. And they all had so many things to say. All I did was let my tape recorder run and, and bask in their wisdom. I guess what I would say to you is anytime you can come out of yourself even just a tiny little bit to hear what all some of these wonderful wise people have to say, um, it's a tiny bit of healing that takes place, but um, she said, um, I asked her to elaborate on something she'd mentioned in her talk, the significance of cherry blossoms in Asian culture. The Japanese see cherry blossoms as a symbol of our lives, Roshi explained. They come at the very early part of the spring when it's cold. Their beauty makes you want to cry. I thought of how I'd meditated in my front yard under thousands of cherry blossoms. One of the reasons why we cry is that these blossoms are so ephemeral, Roshi continued. They will fall, she said simply. And to watch the cherry blossoms fall is like watching ourselves die. We start off young and beautiful, then we become middle-aged and beautiful in a different way. Eventually we're old and beautiful, and finally we're dead and beautiful. One of the things that Zen teaches us in its austerity is that we can tolerate much more than we think we can. We can be sitting, including you know, this horrific grief, we can be sitting with the room very quiet and suddenly we want to scratch our nose, but we can't because we're not supposed to move. So we sit and we abide in the itching. And if we sit there long enough, our nose won't itch. Something else will, or our foot will hurt. We begin to see the impermanence of our suffering. In the village Zendo service, each meditation period lasts only for half an hour. No matter how uncomfortable we are, we know we're going to get up, Roshi said. So we learn to abide. And that was very comforting to me to realize, you know, in, in moments of acute, acute heartbreak and grief and sadness, that one moment is just a moment and it will never recur. There will be another moment that comes along. And um, I don't know, it's so hard for me to provide any kind of, you know, I'm not a professional at doing this, but I hope that's helpful because for me, it's, um, that one moment will never come again, and, and, and another moment will replace it. And then you, those moments build themselves together, you don't even have to build them. They, they, they create a life, and that's what life is made up of, is cherry blossoms dying, cherry blossoms coming to life. All of my thoughts are with you as well. Very grateful for your work. And I'm very grateful for your work. I love you very much, Priscilla. And thank you all.